Welcome to Covernotes, Insurance Europe's series of 30-minute webinars focusing on topics and people making the news in the insurance world. I'm joined today by Christopher Christoph Eureka, member of the board and CFO of Munich Re, to discuss the challenge of meeting the EU's sustainability and other reporting requirements. As Europe's largest institutional investor and a major industry with a unique business model, the, in the insurance industry is an important user and preparer of financial information and sustainability or non-financial reporting. Over recent years, we've seen a very large increase in both regulatory requirements and reporting requirements with which the industry is subject to. Now, while the industry has been very supportive of many of these regulations, SOMT2, for example, and the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, we have highlighted concerns about the costs involved and urged policymakers to find the most efficient ways to make effective regulation. Now, here is our guest. We have someone who's right in the thick of it, uh, helping to uh, manage and run a very large, diverse group. So we're going to hear uh, from him what it's really like uh, to experience these regulations. But first of all, maybe a brief introduction to Munich Re, and particularly how you see Munich Re's role in tackling climate change and the net zero challenge. Yeah, first of all, thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to, to spend some time with you and talk about uh, reporting. Obviously, a very relevant and, and important topic uh, for us as well. We as Munich Re, we have sustainability generally as an integral part of our corporate strategy, our, our Ambition 2025 strategy. And we're looking back now at almost 50 years of opinion leadership in climate risk management. I think Munich Re is well known for their expertise about climate change, about natural catastrophes. So we are we are always had have been very outspoken about that and have been investing quite heavily in, in that area for, for many, many decades now in the meantime. Um, our climate strategy nowadays is, of course, very much aligned with the targets of the Paris Agreement. Um, so we would like to support the achievement of, of these targets. And, and, and as a matter of fact, our, our strategy is centered around three pillars. And the first pillar um, covers ambitious uh, decarbonization targets for ourselves. Um, the second pillar is comprehensive climate risk management. And then the third pillar is the provision of innovative risk transfer solutions to support the transition. And this strategy goes across all our business, across assets, liabilities, and the own operations. So it's, it's a very, very exhaustive and very, very, uh, a very yeah. broad uh, exercise. Can you give some example of how that is translated, those, those objectives are translated into uh, actual initiatives in relation to sustainability and climate change? Sure, absolutely. Um, let's start maybe with the insurance business on, on, on the liability side. We support the upscaling of innovative low carbon technologies by providing insurance cover for those, those, those technologies um, to cover the associated risk. There we focus on energy and, and not only the generation of energy, but, but the, the storage of energy, the, the distribution, power grids, for example, these kind of things. And across many of, of the renewable energies, uh, photovoltaic, wind power, energy storage systems, um, biomass um, power plants, um, so you name them, a large number of, of, of things we're doing there. Um, to give you maybe a little bit more flavor, at the end of last year, our green tech solution unit alone ensured, I think it was more than 900 projects and manufacturers um, from about 80 countries in that area. And the nominal output of these businesses was 55 gigawatts. So it's, I think, quite significant. Well, thank you. That gives a, a very good uh, example of how the insurance industry uh, can and, and does play its role. But then maybe moving on to our, our core topic about the uh, challenge of uh, and the costs related to uh, uh, implementing the reporting that goes around a, lo a, a lot of these challenges and activities. Now, the last 10 years have brought many reporting implementation projects uh, uh, for, for the CFO. SOMT2, IFRS 17, uh, IFRS 9, and now, of course, sustainability reporting. Can you give us an idea of the level of resources in terms of people and costs that these projects have created? Oh, well, yeah, of course I can. Indeed, we have been facing very large projects over the last decade in, in, in reporting and in regulation maybe more generally. And I also myself experienced all of them. Um, but maybe I start from a little bit a different angle um, and explain a little bit how we set these things up in a group. Um, and and you know, we are, as you said, a very diverse group. We are doing business across the entire globe, um, from Australia into the Americas, um, across all continents, more or less. 
So whenever we do something, we have to make sure we do it in a, in a, in a very efficient way across the maybe in, yeah the entire globe. And and to do so, we always choose very centralized setups. Um, so we either have a central IT system or we use existing central IT systems to collect the data. And and we also make sure that the interpretation we 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 have of the standards is is the same everywhere, and the processes are, are consistent and the same everywhere. Um, and by doing so, I think we have a very efficient setup. And and despite that efficient setup, the costs just have been huge, to be honest. Um, so let, maybe let's start with with Solvency Two. I already in the implement, implementation phase, we spent three four hundred million euros, maybe um, for sure, on on only the implementation, and the running costs are. What are they? Fifty million per year, maybe. Then IFRS nine, IFRS seventeen. I, I think for sure the same order of magnitude of costs, probably even more. I think um, so. Also huge. And then sustainability reporting. I mean, it's earlier days now, but I think it's fair to say that our estimate is that it will be for sure one hundred million euros on costs for us as a group, and and, and maybe more. Mm. Now that also fits with a with a, a survey I saw of. Uh, Assessing the total costs of IFRS 17 across the world, which was, I think, between uh, uh, 21 and, and 27 billion dollars. So, if I may add, I mean, the cost is one dimension, but you also have to think about what it means in in in, in reality. Mm. At at one point in our our IFRS 17 IFRS 9 implementation project, we had close to 1,000 people working in that implementation project. I mean, it's 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 a huge number, and it shows how big the effort is. For us as a company, but but at the same time also for the people, because you have to imagine, I mean, those people they have their day-to-day -day job, and on top of that, implementing something like that, I mean, it's it, it's a huge effort for all of them, and I think quite a few suffered a lot of extra work and, and had to put in extra hours to, to make the change happen. We're still very grateful for our teams um, having 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 shown that 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 kind of engagement to make that all happen. Well, having invested all of that time and and, and resources, uh, I have to ask as a CFO. Uh, how do you characterize the return on investment for Munich Re? Well, that's a tricky question, I think, because it's hard to quantify, you know, the return on, on the regula regulatory investment you do. Therefore, my, maybe let's let's try to put it differently. Um, I think we as a group we also welcomed, always welcomed the, these regulatory changes. We're very outspoken about how much we liked Solvency II. We are, we, are, we are fans of IFR 17, to be very open. So we support regulation when it's sensible, when it's reasonable, and then it really helps the industry to improve. And then maybe in particular Solvency II, it, I think it ha enhanced the risk management capabilities of the entire industry quite significantly. So it, it was worth introducing it. And even for us, we, we had an internal model before already, but having the alignment now between our internal model and, and what regulators ask us to do is of course a significant advantage, so we clearly benefit from that. Likewise with IFRS 17, I think the transparency is very good. The international comparability is also very good. Um, and for us, the transparency helps that, that the value creation, as we see, that, mm -hmm. see it internally, becomes also much more transparent for external stakeholders. And I think that's a big benefit. And, and many stakeholders, I think, can understand our numbers now much better than before. Admittedly, the complexity is quite high. And, and I think many of us still have to get used to it. But I, I'm, I'm pretty sure in, in, in a few years from now, everybody will be very much talking only about the big advantages of IFRS 17 and IFRS 9. Um, but, but let me add something maybe on, on a more, more general basis. Um, I think what is important to note is that new regulation, of course, very often is, is very reasonable, very sensible, and it makes sense. I mean, why, why shouldn't it? Huh? I mean, people put a lot of thought in, 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 into setting up the regulation to improve something where, where, where potential deficiencies are, are, are detected. Um, so therefore, it, it's, if, if you look at the overall reporting effort, only looking at new regulation this is sometimes not really the right perspective. We have a lot of old regulation which is still in place. And what I did not see so much in the last decade is, is that old regulation had been discontinued. So we were not good in, in stopping old regulation and, and maybe we should put more effort in that. So whenever we introduce something new, which is reasonable, that stops something from the past. Mm. And then I think the overall effort would be more in balance. And, and that's something we didn't do really a lot. Yeah, I've, I've also heard that uh, it often overlaps and, and is added to but with national regulation as well as the European and, and that all adds to the, the, the total burn. Yeah, of course. But then maybe focusing on, on the more recent sustainability work, uh, in terms of the European sustainability reporting standards, what stage are you at with the implementation and, 
And what are the biggest challenges that you and your team are, are facing? Yeah, maybe let's start where we currently are. We are finalizing our materiality analysis currently. Um, and to explain maybe a little bit what a materiality analysis is, according to the standards, you have to go through all the various aspects of sustainability for your entire business and, and analyze if, if you have a material impact or if there is a financial materiality for you as a company. And this is already quite a, a you know a lot of work to do. It's, 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 it's a huge effort. So that, that's something we're currently doing. And, and given you know, our group, the global footprint, it, it, it's significant work, I, I, I can tell you. Um, so that's something we are doing. And at the same time, we are already setting up processes, systems, IT, in order to be able to deliver the numbers then once we have decided what is material. Because we can't wait. Um, because as you know, we have to deliver in 2025, the, the, for the year 2024 for the first time. And 2024 is about to start. So if, if we are not setting up processes now, it's too late anyway. And so therefore, we are doing the two things a little bit in parallel, which is, is a little bit more complex, but it's, it's, it's the only chance really how to, how to, how to, mm. how, how, to yeah, how, how to make focus. Um, now, what are other challenges? I think the, the biggest challenge for us is, is still how extensive the reporting requirements are. I mean, the materiality analysis helps, and, and there has been effort to reduce the, uh, the, the amount of data to be delivered, but it's still significant and, and still extensive. The second challenge we are facing is the uncertainty when it comes to the interpretation of the standard. Mm -hmm. it, it's not so clear always really how to interpret the standard. And then, of course, you have this discussions in the company because there are certain people discussing it one way uh, or interpreting it one way, other people are interpreting it another way. And you have long discussions to, to come up really with, with a joint view on that. And, and I'm worried a little bit that then also the comparability between various groups will be limited because there is room for interpretation. And then, then I mean, how can you make sure that all the groups in the insurance business are, are, are interpreting the standards in the same way? It's probably impossible. So therefore, I, I also would expect uh, a limited comparability, uh, um, which is also, I think, kind of a challenge. Another challenge is the, the timing. Um, we currently only have uh, sector agnostic standards, mm -hmm. um, which is as a starting point, of course, fine. And, and I understand also from, from standard setters perspective that they start with, with something which, which is, is, is overarchingly covering all, all the various sectors. But um, if we now can expect a sector specific standard to be drafted in a year or two from now, and now implement the agnostic one, there, there is a significant risk of double work, of course, because we now interpret the sector agnostic standard in one way and, 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 and might be facing completely different requirements in a year or two from now, which would then mean more or less that we have to set up everything again. And, 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 and this duplication of work is, is, is really unfortunate in my view. And, and, and for many of the aspects, if we knew already what would be covered by the sector-specific standard, I think would maybe even be reasonable to wait for it mm -hmm. uh, before we do something which potentially is even going into the wrong direction. Um, so therefore, the earlier we could get a, a sector-specific standard, I think I, I, it would be very good and, and very helpful for the implementation. Um, and, and, and another challenge, um, sorry, there are many. Um, <laughs> another challenge is the international comparability or, or interoperability between the various standards. Um, you know, the ISSB is coming up with standards. IFRC has, has put their standards forward now. And, and, and the question is really how to, to comply with all of them at the same time. And, and I know um, all the standard setters, or both of them, they're, they're putting effort in, in, in making them interoperable. But what we are lacking is a clear statement to what extent they are really interoperable and, and, and where we do we have to do additional things in order to, to, to comply with both of them. And, and I'm also not sure how, how, how much they will converge or not, because there are certain differences still visible, at least for me. Um, and, and then finally, the timeline is still is a challenge. Um, mm. To be a able to report in 2024 already means a lot of your infrastructure has to be in place by the end of this year. And this is obviously very, very challenging. Yeah. And I, I think, uh, well, th th you've laid out a, quite a number of challenges there. I think one of, one of the the messages we certainly try to sort of emphasize uh, to the general public and to the the counterparts with the, the policymakers is is just how long it, it will take a few years for this to bed down for everyone to understand really as you say how to interpret how to implement and of course insurers face the double challenge of needing data from other companies in order to do our reporting so it becomes a bit circular and that data is not yet available and not yet and will be a while before it's reliable 
so indeed, uh, 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 quite a few challenges. Um, um, but you mentioned that the the the, the sort of the, the the body of of the requirements is is, is very large and 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 uh, uh, maybe in some ways excessively so. But could you give some examples of which elements are most useful um, and also those which you think are, are less useful? Yeah, sure. I mean, generally, I would say the idea of of of, of steering capital to flow towards sustainable investments. That's very useful. That makes a lot of sense. So that that's good, and also that the standards start from a principle of relevance or or, or materiality, also very useful. It's the right idea. So that also makes sense, and that in the latest version of of the ESRS standards, the direct link to PICA for, for insured uh, emissions is is no longer there. Um, also, I think it makes a lot of sense given the fact that the sector specific standards are about to come soon now anyway. So that that's also helpful. Because because then, then we have more freedom now to interpret the sector agnostic standards until we get the sector specific ones anyway. Um, and and also, I think what's very helpful is that EFAG is now working on 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 interpretation guidelines or, or support for for the value chain and and for the materiality analysis to clarify a little bit more how to to, to really interpret the standards. That's also very useful. So there are certain useful things. Um, at the same time, what is less useful? Yeah. I mentioned it already. I think that the amount of data required to, to be delivered is, is still very excessive. Um, the lack of global alignment, yeah, that, that's not useful at all. And then the extent to which the, the, the certain risks have to be reported for the entire value chain, where it's not crystal clear what really the value chain is for insurance companies, that's also not useful at this point in time because it's really hard to interpret and, and hard to understand sometimes. And, and frankly, the impact is, is questionable also sometimes. So what is really the impact of an insurer? Um, I think you can argue that. And, 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 and looking at the amount of money we are spending for a reporting across the value chain, you could also make the argument if we would spend that money to implement some changes in the real world, maybe we would, maybe we would achieve more than just by reporting about our insurance business. Mm -hmm. Now, in, I mean, one of the reasons why the insurance industry has been, uh, in principle, is supportive of, of the initiative to develop a, a, a data set, which should hopefully be at some stage comparable and, and consistent and, and readily available, um, is because we ourselves, as a, the industry, needs the data in order to fulfill its, its sustainability objectives and, and transition plans. Um, will the ESRS uh, reporting provide Munich Re as a user with the data it needs for its own objectives? Yeah, first of all, we need the data. Absolutely. I can fully confirm that. Um, so whenever we take investment decisions, we need granular and, and good data to, to, to really understand the sustainability aspect of these investment decisions. Um, and uh, also on our investment side, sustainability is absolutely key for us. We invest a lot, for example, in the renewable energy. Or also in, in asset class, I do personally like a lot is forest, for example. Um, forest is a great investment, also from an economic perspective, and, and of course also from a sustainability perspective. So, sustainability matters a lot on the investment side, and we need data absolutely. Um, however, the ESS data, I, I think we have to be a little bit careful here. As you said, it's it's. I mean, it's, there are circles, so it will take some time until really the data quality and, and the amount of data available is good enough that we can really use it. And then also, I think some of the issues we see as a preparer, they would also affect us as a user of the data. So if, if there's room for interpretation or too much room for interpretation, as a preparer, it's hard to, to, to really understand what you should be doing. But as a user of the data, it's also hard to interpret the data you get. Um, and therefore, sometimes maybe less data, but higher quality data or more precisely defined data points would even be more helpful for us also as a user of the data. But yes, I can confirm that we would, would really be in the need of, of more data and, and, and more high quality data in particular for our investment business. Thank you. Um, now, looking forward, uh, the, the EC has promised, the, the European Commission has promised to reduce reporting burden, uh, and that's across Europe, uh, by 25%. And, and they've recently, in fact, uh, published some proposals. Uh, now, at least our first reading, there appears to be quite a, only a little focus on insurance and financial service in general, but what would you have liked to have seen in such an initiative in order to help make reporting more efficient and effective? 
Well, in fact, we really welcomed the initial initiative by the EU Commission to reduce by 25%. I, I personally was even nearly enthusiastic about it. I thought it was really uh, you know, the, the right initiative at the right time. Um, now I'm a little bit afraid that for insurance, the, the current proposal got, doesn't go, go far enough. Um, and, and, and potentially there is a significantly higher need for, for reduction than what we see in the current proposal. Um, but but I think if we really look in what is available right now already, a reduction or a harmonization of the current uh, or existing regulations, I think there is plenty of room for, for, for reductions already. And, and what I said before is, is also still valid. Um, new regulation is not always the issue, but but this continue also part of the old regu regulation. Or if there's something on European level, think about what could it is could be discontinued on, on a local country level. I mean, all these kind of considerations would be really helpful. And 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 we are just so good in, in inventing new things. We should sometimes also just just think more about discontinuing things of the past. Thank you. Um, now. Since I have you uh, here, uh, I think I can't uh, I can't avoid some questions about uh, Solvency Two and yeah. the uh, uh, and the IRD, uh, which are currently in in, in trilogues, uh, as these can have such a large impact yeah. on the industry, but also in terms of uh, potential new reporting. So I take this opportunity to ask uh, your views on the key issues at stake. Yeah, I mean Solvency Two. First of all, it's a huge success story. Um, so I, I think it worked. All uh, it worked well. It still works well. And in, in, it was really a model for, for many other countries or geographies who copied many elements out of Solvency 2 because it works so well. So therefore, I think the key element is maintain Solvency 2. Don't change it too much um, and then make sure it continues to work also in the future. Um, and and I, I think in particular, when it comes to internal model, it's important that we maintain them as they are. On top of that, again, my favorite topic, bureaucracy. Um, so reporting requirements are quite heavy also in Solvency 2. They should not increase. Um, that would be great. Um, I, I think there is a significant risk that they will increase, so that, that's why I'm highlighting the point so much. Um, and then thirdly, on the more technical items, we fully support the insurance your, your positions. Uh, for us as a group, maybe the two most important ones are that the internal models are, are what they are, um, and, and then the risk margin, uh, it, it, it's, it's quite excessive. It's very high. And I think there are very good reasons for a reduction of the risk margin. Thank you. Um, now then, really looking uh, looking ahead to the new commission next year and the new parliament, uh, do you have any recommendations or requests for the next commission? Oh, I can't surprise you anymore. Um, <laughs> so we reduce bureaucracy wherever possible uh, would be my first request. And then maybe more generally, I think a focus on focus on global competitiveness would be really great. Okay. Christoph Juicke, thank you very much for, for your input today. Uh, and that's the end of our cover note. Thank you very much. Thank you.